Um, welcome everybody. I'm very, very pleased to be here uh, today and to talk to you a little bit about our research. It's the first time for me that I give uh, such a public lecture in Russia. And um, as you can see from the title already, I'm a morphologist. I look at the development of animals and their organ systems. And so it's very special for me to be here because, as you all know, of course, Russia has a long tradition of very, very famous and great scientists. And therefore, I think this is really a nice opportunity uh, for me to show you what we do in this uh, field of research. So what I want to talk uh, about today, basically, um, is two things, two subjects I have been uh, involved with, uh, with my group. But before that, I want to give you first a little bit of an introduction about the intellectual background, why we do the things we do, and where the history of this uh, comes from. And you al already see uh, two very famous scientists, Bertolt Hatschek and Charles Darwin, here on this first slide. And they have influenced my way, how I do uh, research very much. And I will tell you uh, a little bit about that first. And then we will talk about uh, two subjects that uh, have been the main subject of study in my group for the last couple of years. But first, and I think this was one of the words I did understand, as Elena mentioned uh, already, Lophodrogosoa. This is the animal group we work with. It is a very big group of animals you can see here. I made a frame around the most important ones here. Um, a big group, and they are all uh, basically, or most of them, share one character. And this is basically a ciliated larva in their life cycle. So this unites all these animals as a morphological character. And on the molecular basis, these animals uh, have shown to be monophyletic. So Lophotrochosoa is really one of these big protostorm groups, the sister group to the ectisozoans. Um, so a very, very important and very, very big group. A little bit about the methods we use. Um, we use ma ma mainly immunocytochemical studies where we can specifically label structures. I will show you some slides uh, in a bit how we do that. And um, we work a lot with confocal microscopy where we can in detail analyze these animals and their organ structures. And we do, of course, also a lot of more classical uh, methods like histology, electron microscopy, and also recently we have started to look at the expression of important genes during development of these animals. So the overall idea is, of course, if you want to do evolution, you need to look at different organisms, otherwise you cannot compare them. And therefore, the most important thing for our research is that we not only have like one animal where we try to find out all kinds of different things only from one organism, but we really do that in a comparative way. So many of these animals we look at in order to get some ideas about the evolution of these groups. And actually, almost all of these animals uh, representatives from all these groups we have so far already studied and this is continuing and is expanding basically. So what are Lophotrochozoans? You see some important animals here from this group and what one immediately realizes is that they all look actually quite different. Some a little bit more similar to each other than others but if you look at the adult forms they're all very uh, different. People have studied these animals in great detail for two or three yeah, two or three hundred years, more or less. Um, and um, every th a lot is known about the morphology of the adult animals. But still, no real, no real agreement has been reached by morphologists about how these animals are related to each other based on these morphological characters um, and how their specific organ systems evolved. So what then people started to do also um, was to look at their larval stages. So I show you some images here of these larvae of these animals. So the larvae are not so different. They look a little bit more similar. And as I mentioned before, they are all united by having some kind of ciliated structure somewhere uh, that uh, they use in order to swim in the water column. So all these animals we look at are marine animals where they develop indirectly via a so-called trochophore-like larva. And this term derives actually from this structure which is commonly <coughs> called a prototroch. So this ciliated structure here and this is actually why uh, where the name comes from. The trochophore like larva and therefore lophotrochozoans. Uh, we don't have to go into detail uh, about that. So all have these kind of uh, larva. 
And of course, we can now look at the larvae and at the adults, but ideally what we always try to do is that we look at the entire uh, life cycle, more or less. That means we don't only look at individual larval stages and at the adults, but we try to get animals to reproduce and then actually look at the entire development, basically from the egg through all these larva stages, through metamorphosis, and you can see a lot of important changes uh, occur here during the change from the um, aquatic phase where the larva is living to the juvenile form, which is a benthic one in this example. So the idea of this is basically to find um, different characters, different uh, characters in the morphology of certain organ systems in order to find out which animals may be related to each other, but also to look at specific structures and organ systems in a comparative way in order to find out about the evolution of these organ systems. And of course, this was not my idea. Uh, this, is, this dates back to uh, several, yeah, 150 years more or less, several decades. And um, you can see in Charles Darwin's famous book on the origin of species that already he mentioned that the structure of the embryo, one could also include the larva here, is more important for classification than that of the adults. So already at that time, people realized the adults are all so different. Maybe if we look at the development of the animals, um, it would be easier to find out something about how they are related to each other. And some of you may know this famous work, this uh, figure plate, um, which is often shown at universities to biology students, famous work by Ernst Heckel, who then basically agreed with Darwin on these issues and he made this famous uh, comparative analysis of vertebrate development. So what you can see is here all these uh, juvenile forms. They look quite different, but when we look at the development, we can see that they are not so different. They are more similar and he concluded from that that they must have a common ancestor, they must be closely related to each other based on the similarities in the development of these different animals. And actually, this was accepted for a while and this was uh, immediately taken up by other scientists also. And uh, we now approach, as you can see, our animals of interest. There are two uh, trochophore-like larvae from two animal groups and one uh, of the first uh, scientists to really look in a very broad comparative way at the anatomy of, of different larvae was actually Berthold Hatschek. He um, did a lot of his re research in Prague. At some point he uh, was also at the University of Vienna, where I am now. So he's basically one of uh, my ancestors, one could say. And uh, you can see he did a lot of very, very detailed, very, very nice structure, uh, structural analysis. In this case of a sipunculin larva, it's also a worm-like creature, but it's not so important here. And he, for the first time, proposed that all these animals that have such a ciliated larva in the life cycle are probably somehow related to each other. Specifically, he looked very much at the annelids and the mollusks and he concluded if the larvae are so similar, they must be closely related somehow. So this is basically more or less the intellectual background, um, looking at the development in order to get data and ideas about the evolution of animals and their organs. So how do we do it? Just a brief introduction of the methods that we used. I told you already we do immunofluorescence staining. This is a technique where we can specifically label uh, specific organs, like parts of the nervous system, for example, but also the musculature can be visualized in a very nice way. And this is commonly done with a microscope called a confocal laser scanning microscope. It's a device like this. Basically, it's just a very uh, nice and expensive microscope which has uh, several lasers that you can use in order to visualize certain structures that you label. And then the really nice thing is you can scan with the laser through your animal and this way you get an exact three-dimensional data set of what the animal looks like or uh, the structures that you label. So it basically works like in this example here. You have a Drosophila embryo here, this is just a fly. This is an example uh, from plant tissue. So what you do is you record a sharp image in the focus plane of uh, one uh, plane and then you go basically through the entire organism. Uh, and then after that you can merge these images 
uh, you can put them together and then you have a sharp image with all the information about the morphology of the animal or the structure that you labeled and you're interested in. And this is just a comparison to show you how nice this method works. This is basically the same individual. It's a small marine worm, it doesn't matter what it is, but you can see it is labeled for its musculature. And you can see the image recorded by such a confocal microscope is a very nicely, everything is in focus, everything is sharp, you can in detail see every individual muscle. And this is the same animal viewed with a normal fluorescence microscope. You can see you have a lot of background and you don't really see very many structures, only these two fibers here which are in focus and the rest is basically just background. So with this technique we really get a very, very nice um, image of all these uh, animals that we want to look at. You can then also record a light micrograph and overlay them in order to see where specific structures in the body are. You can do these so-called uh, pseudo 3D images which are basically, which can be viewed with red-green uh, glasses and give a three-dimensional um, impression already. And what you also can do is then you can use, and this is maybe the big advantage also, you can actually use these three-dimensional data sets and analyze them with uh, 3D reconstruction software. And unfortunately, the animation doesn't work here on this computer, but if it would work, you would see that you can uh, analyze this in very different views. You can do animations and movies and all this. And this is really, really nice because you have to remember the animals we look at are very small, between 70, 75 micrometers and maybe a few hundred micrometers, so much below the millimeter range. And you can already see here these complex structures that these animals have, although they are very small, and that would not be able to do, uh, to analyze in a broad comparative aspect if with the traditional methods that we had before confocal microscopy. So we can generate many data very fast and work in a very uh, broad comparative way. So just a few examples. Uh, this is from my good uh, colleague Elena Voroneshkaya here from Moscow. You can see a very beautiful staining of parts of the nervous system in one of these uh, larvae. You can also see that you can do different labels for different structures, give them different color, and then you can exactly see where these individual structures are located. This is an example from a cephalopod brain. So you can basically look at the brain and see all these different structures you're interested in. And uh, this is uh, basically what we do when we use this method. Another thing that is really nice and what you also can do is basically look at living animals or looking, look at uh, cellular processes that happen during development. So you can label cells that undergo programmed cell death, so-called apoptotic cells. You can label them here. You can see these are all in red. So all these cells of the larva will die at some point. And during metamorphosis, new cells come and they are, they are stained in green, the living cells, the other ones, the dying ones are in orange. Or what you also can do is you can label cells that actually are uh, proliferating, meaning they divide and form tissue and organs and so on. And you can nicely uh, see all these cells where they are situated in an animal. So also uh, live processes can actually visualize with this method. Okay, so this was just a short introduction, just that you know what we actually do and how it more or less works. Um, I want to now show you some examples that we uh, have worked on for the last years and uh, by using these methods and one uh, of the subjects we were very much involved was general neurogenesis, nervous system development uh, of these animals and also the evolution of body segmentation. And this is what I would like to begin with in my scientific part. You may know that several animals uh, in the animal kingdom uh, are called segmented, meaning they have organ systems that are aligned, serially repeated along the anterior body axis. This can include nervous si system structures like these paired ganglia here, for example. It can be appendages um, here like in this uh, annelid or any other structures, muscles for example, excretory systems and so on. And then there is other animals that do not show such a segmented body plan. They have just uh, basically one, um, in this case, sac-like structure where you basically have arranged all these organ systems but you cannot really find uh, any repetition of these structures. 
And people have wondered for 250 years almost now about the evolution of such a segmented body plan. How does it work and how often did it evolve? So did all these segmented animals come from one ancestor or not? What is important here in this ca specific case where we look at the annelids is that these segments do not form in a random way but they form in a very organized way from anterior to posterior by a so-called posterior growth zone here. So all these segments are formed in this area here by cells that divide and split off all these segments and then later in these segments the specific organ systems form. And this is a very unique process um, that is uh, found in annelids. It's a little bit different in arthropods like insects for example, but I don't want to go into that here. Um, and you can actually see that in an experiment that I just showed you um, with labeling these proliferating cells. So what you see here is different larval stages and you can see nicely how these cells are labeled. And you can really see that this growth zone exists. So there are these dividing cells here. They are, this is the active zone. They give off these cells. And you can see in all these stages are these cells uh, nicely labeled. So this is not just a hypothesis. This growth zone, it really exists and it can be visualized. What is interesting for us now is that in these segmented animals, not only the segments form one after another, but also the organ systems that are found in the segments, like muscles and nerves, for example. So if you take a look at this picture, you will see that you see two nerves here on the ventral side, very common for many animals. And these nerves are, uh, are connected by segmentally arranged commissures along the entire body. And you can see one of uh, such commissures here. The first one that is formed in this stage then you see this stage with a second one, with the third one just beginning to form, and so on and so on. And the same is true for the musculature. You see here two muscles along the longitudinal axis, uh, and you see several ring muscles that will form, and you can see that here the anterior muscle is more developed than the second one, and the third one is just starting. The same with these muscles that run from dorsal uh, to ventral. They, you can really see a gradient of formation, meaning that not only the segments, but also uh, the organ systems associated with the segments form always very strict from anterior to posterior. So we have a very nice way to check whether an animal uh, has such a growth zone also by uh, looking at the organ systems, not, o not only uh, at the dividing cells. So why is this important? It is important because several years ago, a hypothesis was proposed uh, where two animal groups, the so-called cypunculans and the acurans, which you can see here, cypunculan here and an acurin here, are or should be included in these animals, these annelids, which have this uh, segmentation. But when you look at the animals, you see they show absolutely no segmentation. So the question is, can this be correct? Do these animals really belong to the annelids and how can we check this? Because these phylogenies, these new hypotheses about how animals are related to each other usually are based on molecular data. So genes are sequenced and then they are compared and then these uh, analyses are made and you, can, uh, and you get a phylogeny um, but no morphological data are used in order to check whether this is correct or whether this is just nonsense. The problem is with the molecules, sometimes we never really know what they tell us, whether they tell us the truth or not. So it is always good to check also with morphology and with developmental data. So our hypothesis was, if this is true, if these animals are within the annelids, if they are annelids basically, then they must derive from a segmented ancestor, of course, like all the other annelids. And if so, maybe we could find some rudiments of this segmentation process during development of these animals. So we looked at the development of the nervous system in these cypunculans. And what you can see here is unfortunately a little bit dark, but maybe you can still see it, um, especially in this image and also here. The nervous system starts to form with two ventral nerve cords here 
which are connected by commissures. And these commissures are, are also formed just like in annelids from anterior to posterior. And to, together with these commissures, you can see individual pericaria, as we call them. These are immunoreactive cells that uh, contain uh, neurotransmitters or other substances and belong to the nervous system. And you can see also these cell bodies form in anterior posterior direction because we have here two pairs, we have three pairs in this one, we have four pairs in this one, uh, and so on. And this is particularly interesting because if we look at the adult animal, this is basically a drawing of an adult animal. And in yellow you see the nervous system. There is absolutely no such a repetition of uh, nervous structures and also they only have one ventral nerve and not two as we found during development of these groups. So what you see in the early stages they have two here, but then what you already see in this stage that in later developmental stages these two nerves fuse and become one and this is basically then the nerve that will form the adult nervous structure. Interestingly, what we also found was if you follow the development further until after metamorphosis, so when you go from the larva to the juvenile worm, what you also see is not only that these uh, nerves here fuse to become one, but also that this arrangement, this serial arrangement of these nerve cells is lost so these cells um, kind of migrate to watch each other and in a late stage, directly after metamorphosis, you can see that these cells begin to cluster in only two uh, areas here and we have no segmented arrangement here. So we have more or less an indirect proof that these animals in the beginning develop the nervous system exactly according to the same pattern as the annelids and then secondarily uh, this is lost and the adult structures are formed. So an indication that maybe these animals were indeed, uh, or in, were in, indeed derived from a segmented ancestor just like all the other annelids. And this would of course confirm the hypothesis of the molecular data uh, uh, that these animals indeed are closely related to annelids, maybe even belong to the annelids. And this is just a 3D reconstruction that we use just to show you um, how nicely you can label all these individual structures and you can analyze them. And this is basically how we found out about this. So we wanted to check now also, okay, if this is the case and if they really uh, develop these uh, organ systems more or less a segment, like a segmented way in the beginning of the larva stage, do they also show on the cellular level such a kind of a growth zone like the segmented animals. And for this we used the method that I just explained to you. We labeled cells that are dividing and what you can see here is that in this stage there is uh, an area here at the end, at the posterior part of the animal and you can see here you have numerous cells uh, that divide and it really looks like a growth zone that we find in the annelids. And this is just a scheme and again very interesting because this is only found in several stages. In the beginning of development this is much more chaotic one could say, much more randomly distributed these dividing cells and also just at the beginning of metamorphosis we also do not find such a pattern. But in some intermediate stages, these two here, we really have a cluster of these cells that, uh, that uh, proliferate from such a or in such a posterior uh, area just like we would expect it from the annelids and therefore um, we can confirm the new hypothesis with these developmental data and can conclude that probably these animals indeed are derived from a segmented ancestor and only secondarily have completely lost this body segmentation that we still see in the annelids. So other researchers also looked at the second group of non-segmented annelids, as one could call them, the acurans. And uh, you can see they don't look very much segmented. They have a very long proboscis here, which they use in order to uh, collect small animals, particles, bacteria, in order to feed on them. And this is basically the body. But again, there is no appendages. It's like uh, just like a, uh, uh, one body unit more or less, but no segments. However, if you look at the nervous system, what one sees is that again we have only one nerve cord, but we have 
a serial repetition of uh, nerves that run in the, into the periphery of the animals. And we also have an arrangement of such periparia, such neuro neuroactive cells that are more or less repeated in individual units along the body axis. But again, these repetition, such a kind of repetition we find, find in many animals and in many organ systems. So this is still not enough to have a condition like in the annelids because, as I told you, for this it is important to look at the development because only uh, if these structures are formed in anterior-posterior uh, progression, then we have a situation as found in the annelids. And surprisingly enough, if uh, one looks at the development of the nervous system, we exact exactly see this situation. So we have um, these neural structures here, these individual nerve cells, and they really form from... What we do see, basically here, is uh, exactly what we expected when we would look at a segmented annelid. We see that also here we have a gradient of uh, formation. Thank you. Very good. So we have a gradient of uh, formation here. You see in this anterior uh, body regions we have more cells. They stain brighter uh, than in the posterior part. So exactly again just like we would expect from a regular annelid. So people then did exactly what we did as well and looked uh, at the dividing cells and again we find exactly the same situation as we have in the segmented animal. This is just the posterior part, so the back side of the animal more or less and again you can see a lot of cells that are dividing in this area and form all these organ systems from anterior to posterior. So again I think a very nice developmental confirmation of the hypothesis proposed by the molecular data that these two groups are indeed uh, belonging to the annelids um, and I think uh, this is a very nice example how we can also check new data that uh, come from molecular data um, and the hypothesis that come from molecular data. I think that is very important um, because uh, with the molecules we never really know what they tell us and we never know how to check that. So, of course, we were interested then um, in looking at other animals because if apparently it is easy to lose segmentation during evolution, just like the cypunculans and the acurans did, maybe this is also true for other animals. And there are many animal groups actually that have a repetition of organ systems, like in this polyplacophorans here, marine animals that are closely related to gastropods, for example. So, these are all mollusks. And looking at the adults, what we find is they have eight shell plates with very complex muscles and a nervous system also with these serially repeated commissures. So the question is now, do these structures develop from anterior to posterior, just like in the annelids, or does that work in a different way? And what we found, and uh, actually our colleagues from uh, Moscow, Elena Voroneshkaya and her group, she was the first one to find that and we did publish in the same year actually. Where is this? Um, so what uh, Elena Voroneshkaya and her colleagues and also we found, we were working on different species actually, which makes it particularly nice because our data more or less confirmed each other and uh, what we found is no, the nervous system in these animals animals do not form from anterior to posterior but in a completely unordered way. So what you see is immediately during development you have in the early larva and here in the juvenile the last commissure, the last connection between these two nerves is the one that forms first and then you have one here on the, on the anterior side of the animal then another one here and so on and so on. So there's, there is no regular pattern, a completely different way of forming this serially arranged uh, nerve commissures during development and also these sets of muscles that you can see here do not form one after another. What, when you look at the late Lara you can see a very nice uh, meshwork of muscles you can see here. This is a 3D reconstruction basically of this animal and you can see immediately there is absolutely no uh, serially arranged repetition of these uh, muscle bundles, you only have a homogeneous network of individual muscles. And only later during development, after metamorphosis, so these are the larval stages and these are two 
different metamorphosis stages after metamorphosis. So what you see is that these individual muscle bundles somehow seem to migrate towards each other and uh, form then after a few weeks after metamorphosis form then these individual muscle units which are attaching uh, to the individual shell plates. But again, this is not a formation from anterior to posterior like this, but they originate simu simultaneously um, as, as one muscle meshwork basically. And only secondarily we have uh, basically here this formation of these individual uh, units. And the same is true for other muscle systems. These animals have a serial repetition here of so-called so transversal muscle muscles. Here it's actually the same. They also form um, simultaneously at the late larval stage. So we can conclude that nervous and muscle system development is very different than in the annelids. They're not formed from anterior to posterior and therefore probably these animals do not have a segmented ancestor. People then also looked at genes. What are genes doing, especially genes that are involved in segmentation of, of arthropods, for example, uh, and how they are expressed. And people also looked at the development of the shell plates. And what you can see here, immediately in this larva, you can see uh, that several shell plates have just started to form. And again, they form simultaneously. And also, if you look at the genes, that are used to make these shells, they're also formed, uh, they're also expressed at the same time, so not one after another. And this is interesting because actually this gene that was looked at here, it's called engrailed, it's a very important gene that makes segments in arthropods. But here it actually doesn't make segments, but it makes the individual uh, shell plates, and you can see it makes these shell plates simultaneously and not one after another. So we can conclude from the developmental data that these, that these animals never had a segmented ancestor. Okay, I want, would like to continue my talk now with a little bit on phylogeny, because as I just mentioned, most of these uh, modern phylogenies, or almost all of them actually, are mostly entirely based on uh, molecular data, on gene sequence data, but not on morphology or development. And this is sometimes frustrating for morphologists because of course in some cases we don't agree with the molecular biologists and then we take a look again at our data and then we come to a different conclusion. And uh, this is what we also did. And I want to show you just one example because that had been discussed for quite a while in, li in the literature. And this con uh, concerns these two groups, the so-called entoprocts or chemtozoans and the ectoprocts or bryozoans. They're all tentacle-bearing animals. They look superficially not so different. They are sessile animals and they basically uh, have this, uh, yeah, some kind of attachment di disc or in case of the uh, bryozoans, Many of them have an exoskeleton. They make little boxes where they live inside. But these tentacular stru structures look superficially similar. And they, this body is more or less uh, cylindrical. And all the organ systems are actually found in this body. So people for a long time believed that, well, if these animals look so similar, then they are probably related to each other. But then people looked closer and looked at the development and found many differences. and then one thought that, well, maybe this is not true, maybe these animals are not related at all to each other or only very distantly. But then in 2007, again, a molecular study showed that, yes, these animals actually are direct sister groups, entoproctor and ectoproctor here, uh, and they should be united together as bryozoans uh, because they come from uh, a common ancestor uh, and form this monophyletic group here. So we were not very happy with this because we knew, of course, all this data from morphology and uh, they are very different. So we looked again at these animals, but while we were doing this, another uh, study came up showing actually that another very strange group that would be interesting to talk uh, one evening only about those, but I want to go into them today, the so-called so Cycleophorans. It's an animal group that had only been described in, uh, in 1998. And um, when they, they were included in the analysis, then the result showed that yes, also these animals belong together with the bryozoans and the entoprocts. And then this group was called the so-called polyzoa. So we looked at all these groups 
and particularly at the endoprops because we had all the data from the development of the mollusks before and uh, what we found was this. These animals have two different kinds of larvae. The first one is a swimming type larva like this one. You can see the prototrop again here. You can see a sensory organ called the apical organ here. And if you make a staining for the nervous system, you can see some typical flask-shaped cells, as I usually call them here, arranged in this apical organ. They are very important sensory cells. We don't know what they do, but you find these cells in basically almost all lophotrochozoan larvae. They are always positive for serotonin, some, sometimes also for other transmitters, but for serotonin always you find these. And in many cases, you find up to four of these cells. These cells then also give rise to one paired nerve here that then attaches to another nerve that is actually found directly underlying the prototroch. So this prototroch here is basically innervated by such a serotonergic cell. So this arrangement of the nervous system, larval nervous system, is very typical for many of these lophotrochozoans. Um, and can be considered as maybe uh, the primitive uh, type of nervous system or the basal type of nervous system of these uh, larval animals. However, s earlier studies from the 60s and 70s have shown that probably these larvae are not the basal type for the endoprops. There is another larval type that is not very well known. It's a very strange larva because this larva it is able to swim, but it doesn't swim very much. It mostly creeps. So it has a foot like this one here on the ventral side, which is used for crawling around on the substrate. And when they like the substrate, they, make, they, they settle down, metamorphose, and become the juvenile animal. So since this was considered the basal larval type of these animals, we uh, took a look, uh, closer look at these animals. This is a scanning electron micrograph, and you can see a little bit uh, badly preserved, but you can still see probably the foot here with the cilia. So they creep on this foot. We have the big prototroch here. So the animal is able to swim if, if it is disturbed. Uh, and actually, in this case, the animal moves in this direction, both swimming and creeping in this direction. This means there is a 90 degree shift of the axis because if the prototroch is arranged like this, in other animals, it would, fly, uh, it would swim in this direction, so into the wall, basically. And uh, this, this is important that we have this 90 degree axis shift for our analysis that I will present now. So what we did is, again, we looked at all kinds of uh, organ systems in these larvae and also at the nervous system. And what you can see by looking at the nervous system, that this is very different from the one we have in the swimming type larva. Again, remember, these animals belong to one phylum. They're all endoprocts, but the larval types are different, and also the nervous systems are very, very different. So this is just uh, a normal staining for serotonin, and here we used 3D reconstruction in order to individually uh, label all these substructures. And what you can see is one important or two important things. For the first, of course, also we have this prototrog ring here and other structures, but what you can see here is four uh, four longitudinal uh, nerves, which are basically um, relative to each other, positioned in a different way because the yellow one is actually very much on the ventral side, directly above the foot sole, and the other one here is situated a little bit more dorsally and also a little bit more to the side. And the other very important thing is this apical sensory organ here. You can see already in this aspect that this looks much more complicated with many more cells than this uh, organ that we had uh, in the swimming larva. This is exactly a similar animal, basically just seen from the side. We have the prototroch here. We have another uh, ciliated structure here on the anterior side. And you can see here these uh, sensory cells, which are basically innervating most probably here this uh, ciliated tuft, which is uh, together called the apical organ. And when we take a closer look at the cell types that we find here, then we see that we again have these flask-shaped kind of sensory cells here, but there is also another cell type, what I call peripheral cells. They're usually bipolar, so they uh, connect to other neural structures from both sides, but they um, are actually always situated around these so-called flask-shaped cells. 
So altogether, very complicated and very, very strange because most Lophotrochozoans have a very simple apical organ. But only most, because uh, when we look again at the polyplacophorans, which are considered as relatively primitive or basal mollusks, what we see there is something different and actually something that is quite similar to the situation we found in the creeping larva. And this is that we again have a very, very complex apical sensory organ here. We have not only four cells, but eight, sometimes ten of these flask-shaped sensory cells. And also we have these peripheral cells that surround, like a ring almost, surround these flask-shaped cells. So only so far such a complex apical sensory organ has only been found in these primitive mollusks and in the Camptozoan uh, creeping type larva that we investigated. And here I just made a drawing just to compare these two nervous systems. This is the polyplacophoran and this is uh, the entoproct or the Camptozoan. And this drawing is actually this apical organ seen from the right angle. So from the same orientation as this because, as I mentioned before, these animals have a relative axis shift of 90 degrees of the prototroch relative to the swimming direction, okay? And if you compare these two structures, they look very similar. And especially, again, very similar if you compare it with all the other Lophotrochozoan animals who have very, very different and much more simple organ systems. What we, also ha what we also find here in both animal groups are these uh, uh, nervous system cells that are arranged along the anterior posterior axis, several clusters. They look a little bit different in both groups, but both have them. And again, we have these four, uh, four longitudinal nerve cords. Here they are more separated, the uh, lateral ones from the ventral ones. Here they are more close together. But the general, um, the general appearance of the nervous system is actually quite similar. So when we look at, this, at these structures, um, what I did here is I just removed basically all these larval parts of the nervous system because these structures will be lost during metamorphosis. And I made just a drawing of a generalized uh, nervous system of simple mollusks. And uh, this is taken from a textbook actually, so this was not our work. Um, and I removed all these structures from this uh, come to so and larval nervous system that we also find in the polypocophoran larva. So basically, this uh, is basically all this nervous system that I think uh, may be homologized with the situation here in adult mollusks and you immediately see, again, this looks very similar. Also, uh, nerve parts around the mouth or innervating the mouth and then the connections here, several connectives uh, and so on. We have these uh, commissures here uh, that connect the ventral nerve cords to each other. The only thing basically that is uh, fundamentally different is we didn't find any commissures here uh, that connect the uh, ventral nerve cords with the lateral ones. But otherwise, it looks very similar. So my conclusion was basically, well, when they look so similar, they have so many things in common, which are only found in these two groups, then this must be due to common ancestry. And therefore, uh, I believe that these animals are actually closely related to mollusks and are probably even their sister group. And uh, this is actually all uh, just a summary of all um, these characters that I just mentioned. But of course, the nervous system is only one structure. So what we then also did is made a very detailed um, investigation based on, uh, based on ultra thin sections and electron microscopy. And this is just, I don't want to go into detail there, but this is uh, just a list of other characters that we found uh, that are only found in this larval type and in some uh, basal mollusks. So again, uh, I think uh, looking at these larvae, we have now a very strong argument, actually, that these camptozoans or entoprocts uh, and the mollusks are actually closely related and that not the entoprocts uh, are a sister group to the bryozoans. I should also mention, maybe, that no molecular analysis has ever confirmed uh, these, uh, this hypothesis. So, so far, we only uh, conclude this based on our larval data and about all this morphological uh, data that we have. But the most important thing I think we learn from all these studies is if we look at evolution, if you look at evolutionary processes 
and also if we want to find out about the phylogeny, about the relationship of animals. I think we have consider animals as entire life cycles. We need to look not only at genes, but of course at the morphology, but not only at the, of the morphology of adult stages or individual larva stages. It is really important that we look comparatively at the development of animals. And this is why uh, I included Bertolt Hatschig and Charles Darwin in the title of this talk, because this was these were really uh, some of these famous early scientists that early on already proposed that we really should look at the development and not only at individual stages or only uh, at adults. So I think this is the most important uh, message uh, that I wanted to tell you. And of course, I want to thank everyone who has been cooperating uh, with me for a long time. And very much I want to thank you and the Dynasty Foundation to invite me and for listening to me. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you. Yes, uh, very good question. Thank you. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, you're absolutely right. It is the question was uh, maybe I should repeat it. The question was about the, the plate uh, of Ernst Haeckel that uh, I showed you about the comparative development uh, of the vertebrates, and um, there had been many arguments about uh, how correct these plates are, how similar these embryos really look like, and the question was. Um, whether they really look that much alike or whether there are more difference. And it's absolutely correct that they are, they are not that similar. The important thing that I wanted to stress with this image also is, and I think that was his main idea, and I think this is the most important thing that we learn from that, is they look, all the vertebrates, they look in development more similar to each other than to any other non-vertebrate. And based on these similarities, we can com conclude that probably these, the vertebrates are one group, one monophyletic group, and related to each other more close than to non-vertebrate animals. I think this is the main story, but of course, um, at that time, um, also the, the images were simplified, maybe even on purpose by him, in order to illustrate his, his hypothesis more clearly. Um, we know now that there are more uh, differences also between these groups in their development, but I think, I think still his main conclusion that if animals look similar during development or, or much more similar to each other than to any other animal group, then we have a very strong uh, argument to uh, conclude that these animals probably are closely related to each other. I think that was the main story and this I think is the most important part of it. But of course the data now uh, we know they are not so 100% uh, correct. I'm a designer. I'm interested in biology. And uh, my question is a designer's question. Do you think we could somehow collaborate, I mean, your science and uh, designer uh, business? Probably we could uh, develop a project which could help us somehow join our efforts. I'm not sure whether that's doable, but you never know. Yes, thank you very much. That was a very nice uh question or, uh, or suggestion, um, I, I may repeat for the non-Russian speaking uh, colleagues in the audience. Um, the lady just uh, mentioned she, she's a designer and she, uh, I think, maybe liked some of the images and she asked whether it would be possible to collaborate maybe as, as a scientist and as a designer. And in fact, um, it's, it's true we have a lot of these images that are really uh, beautiful and we, we get uh, a lot of uh, questions for journal covers and so on and so on. And I personally was also always very interested in art and especially in design and I, I always also had the idea that this would be a nice thing to do but so far I, I was just uh, too lazy to start something like that but uh, I, think, I think that would be a great thing to do, yes, absolutely. So if you're interested we should be in contact and maybe develop something, yes. I would be very interested in collaborating with something like this, absolutely. Uh, tell me, please, do you have any quantitative assessment uh, of similarity of ontogeny? Because all I have seen till now, these were qualitative 
assessments. Can you build an ontogeny tree? Do you have any data for this for qualitative analysis? Qual the question was whether there is a qual qualitative uh, analysis of development rather than a, quanti no, a quantitative one rather than a qualitative one because the data are of course qualitative and not quantitative. But I have to say I don't that, under that much understand the question. I'm not sure if I know exactly what you mean. You mean like making, making a, a phylogenetic tree only based on ontogenetic data and then, <coughs> and, and then try to find out whether this would be, make sense or not. Yeah, that's, that's, that would be a very good test actually, taking all this ontogeny data, making a phylogenetic tree only out of them and then compare it with other trees. Personally, I think we should include all data. All data available we should include in phylogenetic analysis because there is only one phylogeny and there is only one evolutionary history. And if you're interested in that, I think we should use all the information possible. And there are people now that combine actually molecular and morphological data uh, in their analysis, but so far that is not so common. So I think really it is important to consider the animals as, as entire life cycles, use developmental data, morphological data, but also genetic data, molecular data, uh, in, in such analysis. I think that is very important because we don't know which data are, are really the ones that sort of tell us the truth, so to speak, and give us really the right signal to get the right phylogeny. There is absolutely very little known about that. So I think at present it is important to really rethink a little bit our analysis because these molecular phylogenies that we get are so different from each other individuals that work uh, with certain sequences get different trees just based on different programs, different algorithms these programs use and so on. So I just think it's simply not enough to have the molecular trees and we really should get, include all the data that we have from ontogeny, from morphology, from the molecules. Thank you. And as I understand, you have such comparative uh, methods of quantitative uh, comparison of ontogeny, or at least they are being developed, right? You think this is available and I can find it in publications? Um, the data are there. A lot is published uh, on these uh, develop comparative developmental data, so many data are there. But um, what we are currently doing, and uh, my colleague Dr. Thomas Stach is also here, he's very much involved that, in that also. What we are now developing with many other colleagues is a, a database where we include all the, the morphological data that we have. But of course, one or two or three people alone cannot do it because we need so much expertise from so many specialists. And our hope is that we really can convince the scientific community to contribute their data to this huge program, to this huge data matrix that it then eventually will be. And then everyone basically can freely use this data and make their own analysis. And uh, that, that would be, I think, the first step to do that. But it's a lot of very hard work and it requires a lot of people to contribute to it and to convince that this is useful because no one has time to waste and no one really uh, wants to invest in something that he or she doesn't think is useful. So that is at the beginning now and I think we have so many data from so many groups now, animal groups now, um, that it is almost impossible to know everything, to know just the literature, everything. No? And I think that is a very important thing. I have two questions. Uh, number one, polyplaca four are a primitive group, but it's not a basal group for uh, mollusks. Uh, what about monoplaca four? Do you have a similar study for monoplaca fours? And question number two, a general one. How do you imagine the evolution of mollusks now, considering all you told us? Thank you. Very good question. Um, the question was, that polyplacophorans are not the most basal mollusks and whether there were data on monoplacophorans available and how I see the evolution of mollusks. Question number one, it's true, uh, polyplacophorans are at the moment not considered the most basal mollusks. Uh, actually, 
most people, I think, agree more or less about that it is either polyplocophorans or another group called aplocophorans. These are worm-like animals. Um, in the new phylogenies, they come out as sister groups at the base. So then one of those would be closer to the ancestor or the, uh, than the other. And therefore, uh, I just started uh, a new pro project, bigger project, um, where we look also comparatively at the development of these base, basal worm-like mollusks, the aplocophorans. So there will be data available soon, hopefully, in the next one or two years. Um, to complete this picture of the mollusks, of the proposed basal mollusks, uh, the monoplacophorans, unfortunately, are very difficult. There is not so many species you can really collect. Actually, very few places are known where you can find them in, in bigger numbers. And then they are very, very small. And they, have, they, are, they are not free spawning like many of the other mollusks are, but they brood their animals. And brooding animals usually have very few offspring. That means when you're lucky, you may find one or two developmental stages in one animal. And um, that, that is very difficult. And I, at the moment, I don't think that anytime soon uh, we will have good, nice, comparative developmental data on monoplacophorans, unfortunately. And how I see the evolution of mollusks? Well, if this is correct, that uh, the anthroprocts are uh, the, the direct sister group, then we have to assume of course, that this uh, creeping type larva was basal. Maybe this was even kind of the, the basal uh, morphology of the ancestor of mollusks, and that only the anthroprocts then secondarily evolved their sessile lifestyle. Or it could, of course, also be possible if really the aplacophoran mollusks are basal that this. Uh, probably was a morphology similar to those and then we would have to assume that only some of these organ systems like the nervous system and, and these glands that I showed you that they were taken over also uh, by the anthroprocts and that their morphology split off later. Because there are some evidence and some hypotheses that the basal uh, mollusks and, and maybe then also the last common ancestor uh, was really like a worm shaped animal and not like this kind of creeping type larva. But of course one could imagine that then the anthroprocts just maintained some of these organs of the last common ancestor of both groups and then uh, evolved uh, the larval type as such and also the adult morphology secondarily. But again we need uh, more data of course to, to reconstruct really uh, the phylogeny and evolution of these groups. Thank you very much.